Okay, hello everybody. Nice to see you all and um, good to see so many people are participating today. Um, remember there's a Q&A box at the top and um, hopefully you would have got access to the Socrative quiz where um, you should have taken part and done, done a few quiz questions to get you sorted and get you starting to think about things. Um, the Socrative quiz is, there's a link to it in the chat box um, and also um, if you go to Socrative, put in a level Biology Tutor there's another quiz coming up halfway through. Um, next week, it's nerves and synapses at the same time, and you can register on the website. Mm -hmm. So let's make a start. So we're going to look today at plant transport. We're going to look at xylem, phloem. We're going to look at the movement of water, and we're going to look at um, the concept of transpiration and phloem transport. So plants have got an issue. Plants have got water down here and they've got the leaves up here. Now remember plants are taking in carbon dioxide and they're joining carbon dioxide with water that they've split. So in the chloroplasts they split water to produce hydrogen ions, electrons and oxygen. Oxygen comes off as the waste product and the hydrogen ions and electrons are used to reduce the carbon. And that reduced carbon is then used to make carbohydrates such as glucose and then into sucrose, which is the disaccharide. And the sucrose is then transported around the plant. So the sucrose will be transported down to the roots, to tubers, to um, flowers, to fruits to the non-photosynthetic parts of the plant, which are consuming the resources, which are known as sinks, and they're being made in sources. Now, remember the plant is also using the um, carbon hydrogen bonds. So the carbohydrates produced in photosynthesis, it's also using that to make amino acids and DNA. And in order to make amino acids and DNA, it got to get nitrates and phosphates up from the soil and it's got to come up and it's got to go up to the, the leaves where you can then produce amino acids by joining it together with the carbon dioxide from the air. So you can see that we've got two transport pathways, one which has got to move water and mineral ions from the soil up to the leaves, where it's going to be used to make amino acids, DNA and carbohydrates. And then the plant has got to supply the non-photosynthetic parts of the plant with the products of photosynthesis. So you need a second pathway, which is moving the products of photosynthesis to where they're being consumed. So first of all, the plants need to absorb water from the soil and then transport it up to the leaves. And these leaves may be tens of meters away from the soil. They need to transport the products of photosynthesis to all of the cells that would require the products of photosynthesis such as the roots and the stem and the flowers which aren't photosynthesizing. So water and mineral salts by the xylem and sugars and amino acids in the phloem. So let's look at the root hair. So root hair cells are extensions of the root epidermis and concepts here are why the normal concepts of what makes a good exchange surface. So Lots and lots of root hairs gives you a large surface area. They're very thin to give you a short distance for diffusion. Large surface area, and they've got a cellulose cell wall, which is very permeable to water. And one of the ways in which water travels into the plant is it travels up through the cell walls, along the cell walls. Another way is that it travels across the cell walls. Lots of mitochondria to provide ATP for the active transport of mineral ions. Now, the water potential of the soil is quite high. It's quite close to zero because there's water and not a lot of dissolved mineral ions. The water potential of the root hair cells is going to be more negative due to the active transport of ions into the root hair cells. So things like nitrates and phosphates being actively transported in is going to lower the water potential of the root hair cell. That lowered water potential is going to lead but to water following it by osmosis because there'll be a more negative water potential inside the root hair cell. So other features, mitochondria to provide ATP and 
protein carriers to move in the nitrates and the phosphates. So uptake of water. Um, plants lose water through gas exchange. Um, gas exchange, remember, is occurring in the, the uh, spongy mesophyll and the palisade mesophyll. The spongy mesophyll and the palisade mesophyll have to be permeable to allow carbon dioxide to diffuse in during the day. And that carbon dioxide is going to be then turned into carbohydrate and DNA and RNA. Now, as a consequence of the spongy mesophyll being permeable, then water will evaporate. Now, that evaporation of water from the spongy mesophyll and the palisade mesophyll of the leaves is called transpiration, that loss of water. And it's an inevitable consequence of having the stomata pores open for gas exchange. You have to replace that water in order for the plant to maintain its um, turgor pressure in its cells. Now, soil water is a dilute solution of minerals, so it has a very high water potential, very close to zero. The vacuoles of the root hair cells, it's more concentrated, so it has a more negative water potential. So the water enters the root hair cells by osmosis down its water potential gradient to an area of more negative water potential. So the water is coming in into the root hair, traveling through the cells, and then we're going to get to the endodermis and the Casparian strip. And we're also going to talk about the other pathway, which is known as the apoplast pathway, by which it travels through the cellulose cell walls. So there's two main ways in which the water moves in by osmosis. First way is that it travels into the root hair cell and then travels through the cytoplasm. And this pathway is known as the symplast pathway. The next way is that it travels into the cell wall and then diffuses through the cellulose cell walls until it hits a layer of superin, which is a waterproofing substance, which is known as the Casparian strip, which is around the endodermal cells. That forces the water into the cytoplasm and then into the pericycle and then into the xylem. So two main pathways, the apoplast pathway that goes via the cellulose cell walls and the symplast pathway that goes through the cytoplasm and the plasmodesmata. Plasmodesmata are cytoplasmic connections between plant cells. There is a third pathway called the vacuola pathway, and that's where you go through the vacuoles and then through the apoplast path, through the symplast pathway. Okay, so movement across, um, we've got the symplast pathway where the water is moving by osmosis down its water potential gradient into the cytoplasm, through the plasmodesmata, through the plasmodesmata, and then into the pericycle cell and into the xylem. Apoplast pathway moves into the cellulose cell wall, through the cell walls, hits the Casparian strip, which has a waterproofing layer of suberin, very important, comes up in exams all of the time. And the purpose of that waterproofing layer is to force the water out of the pathway and into the um, cytoplasm. Okay, more details on this. So we've got a Casparian strip. Casparian strip is a waterproofing substance called suberin. Purpose of that is to block the apoplast pathway of going through the cellulose cell walls and then force the water into the xylem. So here we've got the apoplast pathway and then it hits the Casparian strip and gets forced into the endodermal cell. Of course, the symplast pathway is just traveling through the plasmodesma and then into the pericycle. Now there is active transport of mineral ions into the pericycle cells, which maintains the more negative water potential here, which causes the water to move into the pericycle. And then it goes up the xylem in the cohesion tension transpiration stream. Another example here, just another picture. So water moving in again through the apoplast pathway and then hitting the Gasparian strip and then being forced through the endodermal cell into the pericycle. 
cross section through a root. Um, so we've got the vascular bundle in the center. This has been stained with a chemical stain. I suspect it's fluoroglutinol and it's staining the lignin a pink color. So whenever you see these, this distinctive section of pink, you know this is lignified tissue, which is xylem. Cortex xylem, firm standard stuff. Okay, so then we start to look at the xylem. Now, two main types, there's vessels and tracheids. They form continuous tubes. There's no end walls, so there's no resistance to flow. You form a continuous column of water, and that continuous column of water can move up from the roots to the leaves where it's evaporating. The cells are dead, and they're dead as a result of the deposition of lignin. And that deposition of lignin means that the cells die, and then the end walls break down, and therefore there's no resistance to the flow. Now, here is where you'd see the um, xylem, and it's in a distinctive X shape. You can see that these are large cells. And then we've got phloem here and here and here. Now I can see a couple of people with questions in the chat box. No? Any questions? No, I can't. There's none there. Right, I'll keep moving on. So dead cells, no cytoplasm, no end walls, and it's easier for the water to move up. Okay, xylem structure. What have we got in the xylem? You've got lignin rings. Now, the purpose of these lignin rings and these lignin spirals is because the water is being sucked up by the evaporation. Well, one of the causes of the movements of the water is the evaporation of water from the spongy mesophyll and the palisade mesophyll of the leaves. Now, if you imagine that I gave you a beaker of water and I gave you a straw and you stood and the straw was 10 meters long and you had to try and suck the water up the straw. Well, you'd have to supply quite a large negative pressure in order to suck the water up. And the first thing that would happen is the walls of the, um, of the straw would collapse inwards. So one of the purposes of the lignin in these ring structures and in these spiral structures is to prevent the inward collapse of the xylem vessels as a result of the negative pressure at the top, which is dragging the water up in the transpiration stream. And here you can see other lignified tissue and rings and spirals. Exactly the same concept of rings exists in your trachea and tracheoles, oh, no, not tracheoles, sorry, trachea and bronchi, um, which hold them open under negative pressure. So the cells are dead because um, they've got deposition of lignin, which makes them impermeable. Um, depositors of spirals or rings. And the lignin gives you mechanical strength. It prevents the collapse of the xylem. It supports the plant. And also lignin, being a polar molecule, ad allows the adhesion of water molecules. Because remember, water is an oxygen joined to two hydrogens. Remember the electron is slightly closer to the oxygen, so there's a slight negative charge on the oxygen and a slight negative charge on the hydrogens. This means that the water molecules will form hydrogen bonds between the other polar water molecules. Now this means that the water molecules stick together, which gives them a cohesion. So they stick together in a continuous column, which is dragged up the xylem. But they also have an adhesion to the walls of the um, xylem vessel because of the lignin. And this adhesion um, helps with the capillary action of causing the water to travel up the xylem vessel. And the capillary action is due to the surface tension of the water molecules with the sides of the xylem vessel, just like the same surface tension that causes a meniscus when you look at a some water in a test tube. Okay, xylem structure. Vessels are the main continuous tubes, uh, main conducting tubes. Tracheids are slightly narrower, um, provide more support. 
And then there's other cell types, which I suspect you don't need to know that much about. Cross-section through a vascular bundle in a stem, um, you've got this, which is strengthening tissue. Then we've got a layer here of flow M, and the flow M, remember, is involved in the transport of sucrose and products of photosynthesis. And then we've got xylem on the inner side of this. So this is the outer part here, and this is your cross-section through, and this is a vascular bundle. And the xylem cells you can see are quite noticeably wider. Okay, let's look. there's a question come in. Would you be able to go through the function of the parenchyma and the colenchyme? Jay, I don't think I'm going to have time today, and I suspect you don't need to know. Okay, let's plow on through. Okay, so here we've got the xylem, and here we've got the phloem, and the sclerenchyme, which is principally strengthening tissue. This is where you get the um, xylem and the phloem. Remember, the root um, doesn't have to support anything. The root is just growing through the soil. Whereas the stem, um, well, the stem has to stand upright if you're a vascular plant. Um, so the reason why you'd have these in a ring structure, the reason why the vascular bundles are in a ring structure, is to prevent the bending and to hold it upright. So how does the water get up to the leaves? So it's a passive process. Initially, you have some movement of mineral ions across the endodermis of the root into the uh, endodermal cells, and that gives you a root pressure. And that is caused by the active transport of mineral ions, so um, nitrates and phosphates being actively transported into the endodermal cells. However, most of the force is due to the loss of water by evaporation from the spongy mesophyll and the palisade mesophyll. And as, as one water molecule evaporates, remember the water molecules are stuck together by hydrogen bonds between the oxygen and the slightly positive hydrogens, and that generates the transpiration stream. As the one water molecule evaporates, it helps to drag up more. So the water is pulled up from the um, roots due to cohesion between the water molecules and adhesion between the water and the cell walls. Adhesion because the water again is polar and the cell walls have got lignin in it. Cohesion is between the, the water molecules and other water molecules. Forms a continuous column and it's known as cohesion tension theory. And because the xylem vessels are so narrow, there's also capillary action um, where the water is sticking to the sides and rising up. And that's important for small plants. Definition of transpiration <coughs> is the loss of water from the leaves. The water is lost through the stomata and moves down the water potential gradient. <clears throat> and it's leaving from the palisade and the spongy mesophyll. Now, as those water molecules are removed from the top of the xylem vessels, you have a tension that pulls up the water um, from the roots. Factors affecting the rate of transpiration? Well, firstly, light intensity. Now, there's some confusion about this with students. The reason why light intensity will affect transpiration is the more light you have, the more photosynthesis you have. Now, because the plant has a cuticle over the leaves, has a waxy layer to waterproof the inside of the leaf, the only place where you can get gas exchange is um, through the stomatal pore, because that's the only part that's open to the rest of the air. Now, the more photosynthesis you have, the more the stomatal pores will open because obviously the guard cells will be inflated more by the pumping in of potassiums um, and also the starch malate pathway um, and that will lower the water potential, the guard cells will swell and it will make the um, stomatal pores more open. Now as a consequence of being more open then you'll get more evaporation of water. So light intensity increases photosynthesis and photosynthesis 
because you need more carbon dioxide, you'll open the stomatal pores more. Therefore, that will give you more evaporation. Temperature, um, warm air has more kinetic energy. Um, so it will cause more evaporation from the spongy mesophyll. And also warm air can hold more water. Humidity, not moisture. Uh, it's humidity that you have to refer to. So if you've got dry air outside the leaves, you'll have a steeper diffusion gradient. So more water will evaporate from the spongy mesophyll into the stomatal air spaces and then out into the environment. That will increase the rate of transpiration. If you have high humidity, that will reduce the rate of transpiration. So one of the functions, one of the adaptations of xerophytes is to increase the um, humidity around the stomatal pores and in the spongy mesophyll, and therefore they reduce the rate of transpiration. Air movement, um, the movement of air will blow away the humid air and replace it with less humid air. That less humid air will mean that you maintain the diffusion gradient of water, so more water will evaporate from the spongy mesophyll. Now, this is a piece of apparatus that you use to um, measure the rate of absorption of water. Now, the reason it says transpiration in a question mark behind it is that you're measuring the absorption of water here, and you're saying that that is the rate of transpiration. Well, transpiration is defined as the rate of water loss from the leaves. But what you're measuring is the rate of uptake. So remember that the water could be being used for other things. So when you're asked to why use of a potometer only gives you an estimate of the rate of transpiration, it's that water, remember, is a metabolite in photosynthesis. So it could be being used in photolysis to be producing the hydrogens, electrons, and the oxygen to reduce the carbon dioxide, or it could be being used to hydrate um, cells that aren't turgid. So it only gives you an estimate of the rate of transpiration. Now, you're all meant to have used one of these pieces of apparatus, and it's one of the required practicals. So you, what you use is a potometer, potometer. You take a leafy shoot, you cut it at an angle and insert it underwater. And the reason for that is because you want to prevent air bubbles from entering the cut um, vascular bundles at the bottom. You don't want any air bubbles in the xylem because you want to maintain a continuous column of water to maintain a continuous transpiration stream. Now you introduce an air bubble and then that air bubble will move because water is being taken up into the leaf well into the stem and then up into the leaves and then evaporating from the leaves the reason why you have this um, tank um, that's to push the bubble back again so you can use these apparatus continuously you can make repeated measures and calculate a mean. So one of the questions from an exam, so explain what's meant by transpiration, describe the factors affecting transpiration. So it's the loss of water vapor through the stomatal pores down the water potential gradient. Factors that infect it, infect, affect it are temperature, uh, kinetic energy, increased air movement, uh, wind, humidity, all that sort of stuff, light intensity. And then how would you use a potometer to investigate that? Set it up underwater, continuous column, make sure it's airtight. How you would change one factor, so you might change air movement or light intensity. Measure the uptake of water by the volume of water per unit time to give you a rate and that will give you an approximation of the rate of transpiration. Okay, um, now is the time to ask questions and also I'll get the other quiz up and get that running so some people can have a think about that. And also I'll get the other quiz up and get that running so some people can have a think about that.
also not get the other guys up and get that running. So some people can have a look at that. And also not get the other guys up and get that running. Okay, so the quiz should be running. Sorry about that. I was getting some feedback with um, streaming on YouTube Live. So the quiz should be running now. Um, please do ask any questions you want. Okay, there's a quiz running now. So what are the questions? What's the difference between capillary action and adhesion? That's a good question. Um, capillary, so this is Jay asking a question. So the answer is that capillary action is the consequence of adhesion between the water molecules and the um, cell walls. And something else on the chat. Can you speak, sorry, can you speak slightly louder? Oh, I'm sorry if I've been too quiet for you. I'll try turning the microphone up a bit. I hope that helps. Anybody got any other questions I'd like to ask? Hopefully you're all doing the quiz. Hopefully you're all joining in. Let's have a look. Oh, I've got lots of you doing the quiz. That's excellent. So what have I got? Yeah, lots of people doing the questions and getting things right. Well done, all of you. I'll leave that going for a few more minutes. Anybody else got any questions? Any questions from anybody? I've got a question. Can you explain what a photometer, photometer does? Well, a photometer um, measures light intensity, but you might mean a potometer. Um, what I explained with a potometer was the potometer is measuring the rate of water uptake. So if I just go back, I'm sorry if it wasn't. So what's happening with one of these, which is a potometer, is that the potometer, the water is evaporating from the surface of the leaf. The water is being taken in through the um, cut stem, and then that water is going up the leaf and evaporating. So the volume of water inside here will be reducing, and therefore the air bubble will be moving along the capillary tube. Now, the purpose of the um, reservoir is that you can open the valve here and then push the bubble back again the other way so that you can use the apparatus continuously. And the movement of the air bubble will um, represent the volume of water that's being consumed by the potometer. 
And if they tell you the diameter of the lumen, um, so if they say it's one millimeter in diameter, then you can halve that, give you 0 0.5, which would be the radius, square it, multiply by pi, which gives you the surface area, and then multiply by the distance moved by the bubble to give you a volume in millimeters cubed. Okay, let's have some more questions. Could we go over the difference between water potential and osmotic potential again? I expect that's probably another lesson. Um, water potential is and osmotic potential are the same. Remember, the highest water potential you can have is zero. And then when you add more solutes to the solvent, which is the water, the water potential goes down because water potential is the ability of a solution to drag water into it. What's the difference between the endodermis and the epidermis? Well, the epidermis is the outside of the root. So it's the where the root is against the soil. And the endodermis is just before you um, you get to the xylem in the center of the root. Um, what else have we got? What would, what would a graph for the rate of transpiration be like? Well, Selena, the would depend what you were changing. Um, if you think about the transpiration during the day, the rate of transpiration would go up during the day and then be lower at night because the stomatal pores would be closed. But the um, transpiration would be affected by temperature, air movement, uh, light intensity. So it very much depends on what your independent variable would be. I hope that's answered everybody's questions. If anybody has any more, then um, please do ask. Okay, I think you've all um, finished the quiz. So let's move on. So now we're on to the phloem. Now, phloem, we've got two main cell types. We've got sieve tubes and companion cells. So the sieve tubes, have got sieve plates at the bottom. Um, you've got a companion cell that's next to it, which has got mitochondria and um, lots of cytoplasm. The phloem, remember, is alive and they're stacked on top of each other and they're called sieve tube elements. At the end, the end walls are perforated where they form sieve plates and that um, allows the flow of cytoplasm through it and also allow cytoplasmic strands to connect cells. They're alive, but they don't have a nucleus and they have very little cytoplasm or organelles. So there is less and there is easier flow of um, cytoplasm through cells. So with each um, sieve tube element, you also have a companion cell. And the companion cell has got a nucleus and has got lots of mitochondria. Now, they're the life support unit for the sieve tubes, the, for the um, sieve cells. Lots of mitochondria, lots of ribosomes, very metabolically active. And they're connected via holes, which are called plasmodesmata, into the sieve tube element. And here is a sieve plate at the end of the sieve tube element. Again, sieve tube element and companion cell. And here is a transverse and a longitudinal section. And what you can see here is a sieve plate and then a small companion cell next to it, showing the relative sizes. And here's a companion cell with a longitudinal section. And that's got a nucleus in it as well. So sieve, sieve elements are the main conducting tubes and they conduct and they transport um, the products of photosynthesis, so sucrose and amino acids, and they transport them up the plant and they transport them down the plant. Now, remember xylem is the one-way flow of water and minerals from the roots to the shoots, and phloem is the two-way transport of 
sugars and the products of amino acid and amino products of photosynthesis such as amino acids and they're being transported around the plant uh, go through this right translocation so products of photosynthesis moved from a source to a sink and the source is where um, the area of the plant where they're being made so a source is an area of photosynthesis and they're transported to a sink which is where they're being consumed so an example of a sink could be a um, root or it could be a tuber so a storage organ and in that storage organ remember it's being stored as starch and starch is an insoluble storage polysaccharide so the storage of starch is going to raise the water potential, which is important. So a source is an area of production and a sink is an area of consumption. Now, how you translocate the phloem sap um, is a source of contention. So originally you had a passive process and in some tissues it is still quite passive or still passive but not in all plants and certainly not in big vascular plants now we think it's an active process and well we know it's an active process so this is the passive mass flow of sugar this is the concept of the passive mass flow of sugar a passive mass flow would involve having a concentrated solution through making sugars and then diffusing into the flow now, when you increase the concentration of solutes in phloem, you'll be decreasing the water potential. So there'll be a more negative water potential in the phloem, so water will move in, which will generate a turgor pressure because the cells will, the cytoplasm will set, the cytoplasm will swell and push against the cell wall. Remember, the cell wall is a has got a tensile strength because it's made of cellulose. So that when the cytoplasm pushes against it, the cell wall will push back on it, which gives you your turgor pressure. Now, that's what happens at the source, whereas at the sink, with the sink, the sugars are either being consumed in um, respiration or they're being stored in a storage organ as starch, which is an insoluble storage polysaccharide. So both of those things are going to be removing the solutes so removing the sugars from the um, flow. Now that will raise the water potential, make it less negative. So there'll be a lower turgor pressure and that will give you the movement of sugars from source to sink. Now, if that is the case, however, what is the function of the sieve plates? Why? have sieve plates if it's mass flow? Why do you have companion cells along the whole length? How can it be that sucrose and amino acids move at different rates in the same tissues? And also big evidence is that there's a high rate of oxygen consumption. And if you add potassium cyanide, you stop translocation or you slow it. Now, any time when you see the use of potassium cyanide, remember it's a respiratory inhibitor so it inhibits the last part of the electron transport chain in oxidative phosphorylation. So it reduces the production of ATP by mitochondria. So whenever you see questions referring to cyanide, they're referring to what is the ATP being used for? Okay, companion cells contain lots of mitochondria. If it was passive mass flow, why would you have lots of mitochondria? And one of the answers is that the um, loading of sucrose is active. So this relies on a co-transport mechanism. So you actively load the sucroses into the companion cell and they then travel into the sieve tube element. And the way this is achieved at this point is that you have a active transport protein which actively pumps out um, hydrogen ions. And so the hydrogen ions are going from a low concentration to a higher concentration. And this is powered by the consumption of ATP. So you generate a hydrogen ion concentration in the source cell, which is the leaf cell, which is where the photosynthesis is occurring. Now, those hydrogen ions 
flow back in, down their concentration gradient, back into the companion cell. As they flow in, they move a sucrose and the sucrose is being moved against its concentration gradient from a low concentration to a higher concentration. So this is a co-transport protein and, and it's moving the hydrogen ions, which are moving from a high to a lower concentration, is driving the uptake of the sucroses, which are going from a low to a higher concentration. As there are more sucroses in the companion cell, they diffuse obviously into the sieve tube element. And then water will move from the xylem into the sieve tube element, which will make the phloem cell turgid. So that increase in hydrostatic pressure, well, will lead to the phloem moving. And the phloem will move down to, towards the sink cell. Because in the sink cell, the sugars are either being consumed or they're being stored as an insoluble substance, which will make the water potential less negative. So you'll have a hydrostatic pressure going from the phloem down to the, the um, sink cell. So new theories, it's active. You actively load the sucrose into the phloem. So you actively pump the hydrogen ions out and they re-enter by diffusion through a co-transport protein. Remember, hydrogen ions pumped out from a low to a higher concentration, and then those hydrogen ions flowing back in through a co-transport pump, which is moving the sucroses against its concentration gradient into the um, companion cell, and then into the soup tube element. Um, cytoplasmic streaming could be responsible for things going in, in either direction, but that's a small part of most of your specs, and I suspect it's something we don't need to get into now. Um, and there are also protein filaments that pass through the sieve pores, and that could also mean that different solutes are moved in different directions in different filaments. Move through that, move through that, move through that. Right, translocation experiments. So ringing experiments, um, students are sometimes confused as to why they, they're, they're shown to them. Well, ringing experiments, experiments just prove that the sugar is moved in the flow. Because when you remove a ring of bark, you've got the xylem is intact. Because remember, the xylem is further into the stem. Um, and the phloem you've cut through because you've removed it. So the phloem would be running down the stem and then you've removed a ring of phloem. So by removing the ring of bark, you've cut through the phloem and what you see is an accumulation of the products of photosynthesis in a bulge of sugars above the ring. So that suggests that sugar moves down the stem in a phloem. Translocation experiments, um, this is sort of cruelty to aphids, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, so with an aphid, you, aphids, remember, push their stylets into the phloem. So this is a ready-made experimental device for investigating what's, uh, what's in the phloem. Um, you can either take what's called the honeydew, which is the um, remnants of the phloem as it's passed through the aphid, because remember the aphid is a holozoic feeder just like you. Um, or you can cut off the stylet and then look at the exuding phloem from the stylet. Unfortunately, the aphid doesn't survive that experience. So things that you can look at is you can cut stylet off and then you can collect the phloem um, to have a look at it and analyze it. Radioactive tracers, um, this is worth mentioning because students do get a little bit confused about this. So you can put radioactive um, carbon dioxide in a bag surrounding an illuminated individual leaf. Now this would be um, carbon-14, which will decay giving off um, radioactivity. 
Remember, it's not the carbon dioxide that's transported around the plant, it's the products of photosynthesis. So the carbon dioxide will be um, fixed in photosynthesis and will be turned into um, triosphosphate and then into sucrose. So it will be radioactive sucrose that will be transported around the flow. So the carbon dioxide, which is the radioactive carbon dioxide, the carbon-14, is incorporated into sugars and transported in the flow. And then the aphids, which feed on the sugar, you can see how long it takes that radioactive carbon dioxide to come out of the aphid. So it gives you an idea of the rate of movement of, of um, the products of photosynthesis through the flow. Autoradiography, auto means self, and a radiograph is a photograph taken with radioactivity. So you take um, radioactive label carbon dioxide, you put it into a bag, um, and that carries out photosynthesis, which fixes the carbon-14 into sucrose. And then you put the um, plant onto photographic film, leave it in the dark, and when you develop it, you can see where the, um, the radioactivity is, because that's where the carbon-14 has been introduced into the leaves and then has traveled through as sucrose. So you can see it because it will fog the negative just like an X-ray. Um, if we, anyway, and that shows that sugar moves up and down the stem. All right, next thing I was gonna do is talk about xerophytes. So I can see I've got one more question there. Which pathway out of apoplast and symplast accounts for more water uptake, says Abby. A uh, good question, Abby. I suspect it's the simplast, although I really don't know. So sorry for that, but um, I suspect the apoplast. No, sorry, I suspect the simplast. Okay, let's have a look at xerophytes. The xerophytes are rather lovely, um, look beautiful adaptations. So xerophytes are adapted for reducing the rate of water loss. So their superpower is to grow in conditions where other plants can't, can't grow because they would lose too much water. And either water's in a very scarce um, because it's either hot or it's very dry. So adaptations are to reduce the rate of transpiration. So you would roll up the leaves and that reduces the surface area. You put the, sunken, the stomata sunken, so the stomata are here and here and here and here. You put them in pits so that the water vapour is trapped um, outside the stomata and, it, and inside. So this reduces the water potential gradient so there's less evaporation of water, but you can still have diffusion of carbon dioxide. You have hair-like structures which trap the water vapour and trap the air. So it reduces the water potential gradient. And then you have a thicker waxy cuticle, which is thicker than a normal mesophyte leaf, and that will reduce water loss as well. So roll it up, have reduced area of spongy mesophyll, put the stomata pores in pits, have hairs, have a thicker waxy cuticle. Hydrophytes, well, hydrophytes don't have a problem with obtaining water. So they don't need a xylem, really. So they have a poorly developed xylem. They don't have any um, a cuticle because that would just um, mean that more light was reflected, so there was less photosynthesis. So they've evolved to have no cuticle on the leaves because they've got lots of water. They've got the stomatal pores on the upper surface because that's where the carbon dioxide is for the air to diffuse, the carbon dioxide to diffuse in so that it can be used in photosynthesis. And you've got large air spaces um, in the stems and leaves to hold oxygen and carbon dioxide and make the thing float. So that's a hydrophyte. Okay, we've got to the end. So if anybody has any more questions, now is a good time to ask. Um, I'd be delighted to answer any. Um, if not, then it's been lovely seeing you. I've got an all time record of people turning up for one of these, which is great. It's good that you're so interested. Um, next webinar is on Sunday the 12th and it's on nerves and synapses. Um, if you found this useful, then tell your friends. Um, subscribe to on Twitter or on YouTube. Um, visit my uh, 
website, which is alevelbiologytutor.com, and you can register there. Um, I've also put on the OCR 2017 papers, so the biological diversity and the unified um, biology and the biological processes papers. I put that there available for download, but I think you do have to pay those. Um, and the same with the edXL papers I put on as well. And if anybody has the AQA papers, then um, let me know and I'll do those. Any more questions, people? There's something in the chat box. Cardo, you're saying thank you. Thank you very much, Cardo. It's a pleasure. Hope you're well. Any more questions, people? And you've said, oh, that's interesting. Millie, you've said, is there any parts of a plant that can act as a both a source and a sink? Well, yes, there is. Um, uh, if you think about a tuber, um, a tuber or a storage organ, so like an, you know, an onion bulb or a potato, that can be a sink and a source because it's a source when, it's, um, when the plant is growing from that tuber and it's a sink when it's being stored. So yes, there are parts of the plant that can be a source and a sink and they're principally the storage organs. Any more questions, people? Question related to this, do you upload all webinars to YouTube? Um, it should have live streamed on YouTube and then I normally um, um, I normally um, record these, but I think I forgot to do this one, but we'll see.